Amen. All right, let's take our Bibles and look in Genesis chapter 2. And we'll finish our reading of this chapter that we started last time, Genesis chapter 2. And my text is going to be from verse 18 down to verse 25. Here we have the narrative of how God created the first woman. We saw already how he had created Adam and placed him in the garden. We don't know how long, how many years, maybe even went by. It would have had to have been enough time for him to name all the animals because it's at the end of that that it was made known by the Lord that it was not good that man should be alone. So that's where we begin verse 18. Genesis 2 and verse 18. And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. So when the Lord declares here that it was not good that man should be alone, this is really the first time we find where the Lord said it is not good. Because at the end of the last chapter, we saw that he saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So that's significant when you consider what wasn't good, what was not complete. And the answer was the aloneness of the man. And here we see that God never purposed that man should be alone that's true even in the marital sense but also in society and so what I see here is a picture already because the first Adam was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ the last Adam and just with as with the first Adam the father saw that it was good that he should have a wife, a woman. So with the last Adam, he had purposed that it was not good that Christ should dwell alone. And so we see here in God's purpose that he always purposed that there be a people, a bride to give to his son and for whom his son would come into the world and he and that people would be one. This is where it begins in type and picture and prophecy and promise. And so he says here that he would make him an help meet. That would be someone comparable to him. And when we say a helper comparable, again, it's a picture and type of the marriage relationship where God created the woman to be perfectly suitable to her husband. And again, I see a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about those that the Father chose, you think, well, there's nothing suitable in them. And for sure, because they're sinners. We're sinners. And yet God purposed that by being united to Christ, and as we're going to see here how Eve was taken from Adam's side, so God purposed to make a people, a bride, a church, to be suitable to his son. And that's why when Christ had finished the work, he declared, Behold, I and the children whom thou hast given me. He rejoices over his bride, just as we're going to see Adam rejoicing over this woman that the father would give him. But when you see that word, a help meet for him, it's like in any marriage relationship, it's a give-give. Not only would the husband be meet for her, in other words, a help mate for her providing for her all that she needs but at the same time the woman would be made comparable to him 
In other words, a help meet to Adam. And that's an amazing thing when you stop and think about what Christ has made of his church, that by his work and that church coming from his side, just like Eve was from Adam here, that that church would actually be a help meet to Christ. We don't think about that a lot of times, but he rejoices in his bride and rejoices in their worship of him, service of him, everything that the church does for him, he rejoices. But now in verses 19 and 20, it says, and out of the ground the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field but for Adam there was not found and help meet for him. So you can see this is the theme down through here. There was no helper, help meet found comparable for Adam among the animals. The Lord brought them to him and gave him that role to name these animals. This shows before the fall what type of intelligence that Adam would have had a perfect intelligence no sin no depravity at this point and shows how he would have been made in the image of God using that wisdom that was given to him to this point Adam's intellect would not have suffered from the fall and in that sense you could say he was likely the most brilliant man who ever lived as far as men are concerned I know that Later on, the Lord commended Solomon for his wisdom. But here, pre-fall, I don't think we can even fathom what it would have been like for God to have made him in his image and given him that mind. But again, I see a prefigure of the Lord Jesus Christ, the last Adam. Even though the first Adam was granted this wisdom in order to name all of these animals and you could say he's probably the greatest biologist or botanist that ever existed but yet Christ being the last Adam who can compare to his wisdom in Christ all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are given so Adam gave names it's interesting that Adam did not name any other animal after himself. Have you ever run into an animal that's called Adam? Maybe unless you call your dog or a cat that, but not a, a type of animal because there's a, dic a distinction here that's made clearly between man and, and animal. That's why scriptures warn against that perversion of bestiality where men and animals endeavor to copulate. That's, that's something that should never happen. There's a separation. And thereby we understand that there is a difference then between humans and animals. I know I've got pets and I enjoy them and they have their certain personalities if you could use that particular term and yet there's a difference in how God has made man in intellect and reasoning and animals have instinct but when it comes to spiritual concepts or the ability to think and reason even logically or abstractly that pertains unto man and especially when it comes to a moral or spiritual thinking we know that man in his depravity his conscience is fallen 
And yet, as Paul wrote there to the Romans, that conscience is either accusing or excusing one who exercises it. And that's a distinction that there is between man and the animals. Animals don't exhibit these qualities in the same manner. It's interesting, though, because dogs can cower. They can show fear. Sometimes you wonder what it is that makes them that way, but certainly cannot be compared to man. And then as far as creativity, an animal is an animal and does according to its nature. A cow is a cow, and a goat is a goat, and a chicken is a chicken. And they have their particular characteristics. But you look about at the variety that there is among men and humans. They're often creators and innovators. And I'm talking about even in a fallen state, the ingenuity, the ability to create things and make things capable of producing art or literature, music or technology. Every once in a while you'll see somebody's trained an elephant to paint and he's learned to use his trunk and do some things, but that's pretty much something that is learned by repetition perhaps, but you don't ever think of an elephant just going into an art studio and sitting down and starting to create a bunch of other things. But humans, given that creativity by God, and yet in their depravity, they use it in opposition to God's glory. They take the glory to themselves. And that's why it takes the Spirit of God to cause them that anything that, that we do, it's because God has given us the talent. So here's the distinction. You can imagine Adam after naming all of these and looking around and still there was not found a helper. That's the point that we see here in verse 20. There was not found an help meet for him. This shows the kind of perversion that there is today in uh, depravity and I've heard of different ones marrying, legally marrying their pets or marrying this animal or even now marrying AI type people and created, you know, computer generated. All of that just shows how far man has fallen because the way that God has created these relationships is that it be with the man and the woman. So it was obvious here to Adam that these animals and it appears or seems that they were brought to him in pairs. He gave names to every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Just like he brought these animals into the ark two by two. There would have been male and female among the animals and that's why you have perhaps different names depending on their gender. But God deliberately had Adam name the animals after seeing his need for a partner there in Genesis 2 and verse 18. And the Lord used this doubtless to prepare Adam to receive the gift of the woman. No animal could ever serve as his help meet. And I think about that in terms of redemption and salvation. The animals were used as types of Christ's sacrifice, but they could in no way take the place of Christ. It required him coming and shedding his blood in order to redeem and God to justify his people. And so that's where we see in verses 21 and 22 where God makes the first woman from Adam's side. It says here in verse 21, and the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. That's the first indication that he would have slept. I don't know up to that point whether he needed sleep, but here specifically, it was for the Lord to operate. This is the first operation by God himself that you find in scripture, because it was a very real physical operation. 
It says he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. I can imagine how beautiful she must have been. This was the Lord's doing. And again, he didn't give Adam a choice. He didn't show him three or four possibilities. And now, Adam, you choose. No, it was the Lord who appointed Eve for Adam, just as he appointed that bride for Christ. And Christ was contented. But God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam. This was the first surgery recorded in history. And God even used a proper an anesthetic, anesthesia of Adam. And the rib which the Lord had taken from him, that he made into a woman. So God used Adam's own body to create Eve to forever remind him of their essential oneness. And I can't help but think about the Lord Jesus Christ, how God purposed that that people that he would give to his son should be one with him, united with him from his body. That's why it was necessary that he come in the flesh, because from that seed, God would raise up an Eve or a people that he would redeem. And as Adam came to know Eve, he would see many ways, doubtless, that they were the same, but he would also have seen many ways that they were different. People are trying to, in the name of equality, try to say that there's no difference between man and woman. Well, they're fighting against what was clearly the way God did it in the beginning. And yet she was made from his side. Anatomically speaking, both men and women normally, some people say, well, if you count the ribs, man's missing a rib. No. Anatomically, both typically have 12 pairs of ribs. And this number is consistent across sex and, and does not differ based on gender. I grew up thinking that. There was one less rib because the rib was taken to make Eve, but that's just myth. But here's where we see the comparison with the Lord Jesus Christ. Just as Adam slept, it's a representation of Christ and his death, which was asleep, and that from his wounded side, think about the Lord taking and open up Adam's side to bring forth that rib. That was necessary because Adam was a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that from that wounded side, we sing about that all the time, that blood and water that came forth, there would have been real blood that would have been shed at that point to bring forth this woman unto him. And there's that Jewish tradition saying that God made the woman not of a man's foot to be under him, nor out of his head to be over him, but she was taken from under his arm that he might protect her, and from next to his heart that he might love her. I kind of like that comparison when you stop and think about the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, we're subject to him, and yet when we're one with him, all those that are the fruit of his death and his wounded side are loved and protected by him. So here it says he brought her to the man. I think that's significant as well there in verse 22 because that's what God does with each one for whom Christ came and paid the debt. He brings them to him. They don't come of their own will, but he brings them to him. And uh, what a beautiful relationship there would have been then. And then in verse 23, we see Adam's brilliant understanding here of who Eve is and her connection to him. 
How did they communicate? The scripture doesn't say. What language? The scripture does not say. But he says here in verse 23, Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. This is bone of my bones. He recognized that Eve was both like him, bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, and yet not like him. He didn't call her man, but woman, <clears throat> which means to be taken out of man. And therefore they were one, but they were not the same. Flesh of my flesh. Here again I see a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. Why did he come in the flesh? To identify with those sinners that the Father had given him and from whose side then this church would be created and made. So there's that essential oneness that we see is a picture of Christ and yet distinction as well. We can't say that since we've been made like Christ, we are Christ. No, he's, he's Christ. He's the last Adam, but at the same time, we are one with him. And he says she shall be called woman. Woman is a compound word. Somebody jokingly said, whoa, man, but that's not the sense in the old English. The word woman used to be spelled as withman and it was later transformed into woman. Wif is female and man is human. So a, a female human is what woman means. And again in our society today in this depravity they're trying to you get even Supreme Court justice that when asked for you know, confirmation, can you define what a woman is? She, she, it wasn't that she couldn't, she wouldn't. Because there's this mindset that there should not be this distinction. But again, it's rebellion against God, it's against, rebellion against even the type and picture of what this is of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verses 24 and 25, it says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So here we have in scripture the simple definition of marriage. It's a man with a woman. It's not man with man. It's not Adam and Steve. It's Adam and Eve. And again, people in their depravity are trying to fuzzy the lines. And when you read Romans 1, you find that they do so out of rebellion and that God has given them over to their own reprobate mind. But a marriage is not a certificate. There are a lot of people that go down to the courthouse and they get that certificate and they say, I do, and then given a little bit of time, they say, I don't. They say, I love you, and then the next thing you know, I hate you. And that's the reason is because a true union is not a certificate it's a union of hearts that's exactly how it is with the Lord Jesus Christ he set his love upon that bride that the father gave him it's like he brought Eve to Adam and he loved her and they became one flesh this is not just a sexual act but the whole concept there of one flesh means living together and working together and thinking together and being united together because there are a lot of so-called marriages where there's sexual activity but there's no love there's no union here when it says they shall become one flesh it has to do with each one being comfortable with the other and complementing one another and it says they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Before the fall, Adam and Eve were both naked and not ashamed. The idea of nakedness 
is again far more here than just nudity. It has a sense of being totally open and exposed as a person before the other and not being ashamed, nothing hidden. And so to be naked and not ashamed means that they were comforted in that relationship. That's a true marriage. And as I said, not just a certificate that people get. Even the world knows the ceremonies. You see all of these different so-called marriages going on, but that's not true unity or union where the Lord has given a love of the husband for the wife and it's heart to heart. There you can tell that it's a marriage that the Lord himself has brought to pass. And I think too the fact that Adam and Eve were naked and were not ashamed is a type and picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was stripped naked of his garment of glory. He set that all aside to come down and he bore, he bared himself, if you will, for his people. And at the same time, his people stripped of their garments of self-righteousness and that in that action the two are made as one united together Christ with his people and his people with Christ and not ashamed knowing that it was for them that he bared it all in order that they might be his people well I hope that's helpful there's a lot there but may the Lord bless what we've read Gracious Father, I thank you for your word. How precious to see how you've set everything in motion and uh, that your way is perfect. I pray that through this we would see even more clearly just how much you have loved sinners such as we are in your son and that through his death, his wounded side, you have made a people unto yourself and have united them to him forever in love and uh, in uh, oneness. And so may we rejoice in that great work, if indeed we're yours. And I give you the praise in Christ's precious name. Amen.